uh, we have a wonderful interview lined up with Joe, Justin Holsomback. Uh, he is a progressive Democrat running in a very red state of Georgia, House District number 34. We'll be doing that interview with him momentarily, and Justin has um, been so kind to come on early to do the interview, and he's going to hang out with us during the debate coverage along with other members from the Progressive Army, uh, the usual suspects. So that's what we're dealing with tonight. I want to thank the ladies of the Progressive Army. I want to I want to thank uh, and bring on um, Justin Holsom back. One, I want to uh, first, <laughs> okay, there's a lot of things I need to say about this young man. Uh, the first of all is that we, um, Justin, I apologize, we spelled your name wrong, and that's um, that's my bad. So, uh, listen, I want to thank you for coming on. I'm trying to make sure that your microphone is nice and uh, actually. Can you hear me now? I can hear you loudly and clearly. Justin, how are you, my friend? I'm doing fine, man. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for adjusting your schedule and coming on earlier. And uh, the third thing is, I apologize, we spelled your last name wrong um, on the flyer. Our, our graphic designer, he's changing that now, and we'll get out the new one. But it's Wholesome Back, B-A-C-K, is that correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a mouthful. It's, it's, my, it's my burden as a politician to make people be able to say my last name. Yeah, yeah, you know, wholesome back. Um, um, how often? <laughs> I shouldn't do this, but um, how often do you get hassle back? Daily, I get uh, Holland back, Holson back. Just if you just change a vowel somewhere in there. You've gotten every variation. Well, um, so wholesome back is what we want to. I like your website, man. I've been on your 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 website, um, and I looked over your issues. You are a progressive in the very red state of Georgia, running for the 34th district, if my memory serves me correctly. Yeah, and that's the Kennesaw and Marietta area. And this district, if you just even outside of the state of Georgia, staying red for so long, our district has stayed red for the last six presidential cycles. And wow. there's almost no Democrat challenging the Republicans for this district, which is crazy to me because this district includes Kennesaw State University. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the uh, university systems in Georgia, Kennesaw State University is actually the third largest, largest university in the state. So we have a what I call a secret weapon, although it's not that secret. We have a, dist we have a university that is fired up. There's a massive amount of support on that count, uh, campus for Democratic candidates for president this year. Okay. And we're going to try to tap into that to make our campaign be able to counteract that uh, red stain, if you will, on our district and try to have actual discourse and actual democracy and progress in our district. I'm sorry. You said the red stain on your district and in your state. That's uh, uh, that's pretty bold language there, but I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Kennesaw, Kennesaw State University, there's a lot of energy in that area. You said Marietta, Georgia as well? Yeah, it, it kind of cuts off right above downtown Marietta, but we get about a mile north of it, which is a lot of still the city uh, mm -hmm. housing. And the reason why I say the red stain is because we have a bill going through the House of Rep or the uh, legislature in Georgia right now called the First Amendment Defense Act. And what this will allow is kind of like how we segregated back in the 60s on racial and those kinds of lines. This bill would now legalize bigotry and discrimination against LGBTQ plus members that go into a business holding hands of their significant other, and that business owner can claim religious differences with that person and shoo them out of their business like an animal. And that's the type of legislation that we have whenever you start electing 120 members of a 180-seat body, Republican conservatives, you start getting legislation like that that is just the epitome of regression. So let's talk about your race because a lot of people are – you did an AMA on the Bernie subreddit today on the Sanders for President subreddit, and some of the questions that you were asked were why are we focusing on this, um, this seemingly insignificant state race, this District 34, Kennesaw State University, Marietta, Georgia, you know, the backwoods. You know, why are we on a national level focusing on this local level? Um, what is the significance of your particular seat, particularly in light of the legislation that you say that they're going to pass in your area? So I just went into it a little bit, but just to really explain it and show people why this should be important to them. Right now, there, there's 180 seats in our House of Representatives in Georgia. And right now, 119 of those seats are controlled by Republicans. There's one independent, 
who has always voted with the Republicans on legislation, and there are 60 Democrats. That gives Republicans a 67 percent majority in the House of Representatives. What that means is they can push constitutional amendments and bills out of debate and amendment phases without any sort of debate. They can just push it through upon, along party lines. Hmm. All they have to do is put something regressive like this First Amendment Defense Act that I was just talking about that is discriminatory to its core. And they can just push that through their, the Congress without any sort of debate, without any sort of discourse on the bill. No amendments even on the bill. And a constitutional amendment, this is why it's so important, is because our constitutional amendments do have impact on the states, especially around us, but even on a country as a whole. Yeah. If we pass legislation like the First Amendment Defense Act, what that means is we lose our film industry. We lose jobs in this, in this state because with the film industry that films in Atlanta area has already said they're going to leave. Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. I know the film industry there in in Atlanta. Uh, one of the the part, the Walking Dead crew shoots there in Atlanta, and you mean to tell me that they, along with other people, would leave Georgia? And it, it, and of course, I don't want to belittle. I'm not belittling it. Like the legislation itself is reprehensive, right? It's it's disgusting. So you're saying that your seat, if you can get elected to this seat. How does that stop the majority? Or are you just simply going after the supermajority, which will at least allow debate? We, If we can flip just my one district, what that means now is they drop below the threshold of a supermajority. Anytime a bill gets proposed to the House of Representatives, we can now stop a constitutional amendment if we, if we want to. If as a party, the Democrats say, no, this is regressive, this, this hurts the uh, people that we represent, we can now stop that amendment. If a bill comes through, we can keep that in debate phase and amendment phase and either kill the legislation that would be harmful to people in our constituencies, or we can amend the bill to actually work for the people instead of against it and for special interest. And so just the one seat, just the one district turns restores democracy, in a sense, back to the House of Representatives in Georgia. Or at least gives you a fighting chance, right? Um, so let's let's get into some of the, the minutia of your particular district, because every district, at least um, that I've yeah, I think every district has a rating, plus or minus, uh, uh, for you know, red. You know, how many, how 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 Republican is the district? So what is yours? Is it like plus ten? Is it plus fifteen? Plus twenty? Do you know um, what what's the makeup? The 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 yeah, what the hell the word. <laughs> We, have, we haven't given it that point scale. What we have done as a, as a campaign team is sat down with the state and county level democratic organizations and started to plan out exactly what it would take to us, for us to flip the district. Mm -hmm. In our district, we have around 12,000 voters that vote consistently every single election. So those are the people that will be going to the polls in November without fail. And, so, and the breakdown is approximately about 7,000 to uh, 3,500 Republican mm -hmm. and Democrat. So if we can flip 3,000 of those voters and, and also reach the moderate, the swing voters, the people that sometimes they don't really go out for a whole lot of elections. If we can flip those along with those 3,000 voters, then we have a real shot at winning in November. And we have all of our campaign plans are pointing towards grassroots efforts, canvassing efforts, staffed by volunteers that we've started recruiting for the campaign to reach and knock on every single door in the district, not once but twice. Because if the most cost-effective way to flip a vote is to have a conversation with them, to know what's important to that voter, to know what they want for their family, and to show them that as a candidate, I can represent those interests. And that's what we're trying to do, is to flip those votes to us and show them, just because I have a D for Democrat next to my name, does not mean that I cannot help you, you as a family, as a voter, as a citizen, and that my platform is progressive, but it's also friendly to both sides of the aisle. It's, a, it's based around education reform, mass transit opportunities, and removing voter restrictions that keep people from voicing their opinion in politics. Okay, so let's ask some other questions because if you're running in a predominantly red red district and you're going to knock on every door, you're going to knock on every day, door twice, then, then, you know, what else, what other policies do you have? Because this red district is not going to be as embracing of a of a progressive as they would, let's say, a blue dog Democrat or a conservative Democrat. So what policies could you possibly agree with them on that they would say, OK, Justin is our man? As a candidate, my district, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the city of Kennesaw, but the city of Kennesaw a few decades back passed an ordinance that said all citizens, all households in that district have to own a gun. It's codified in Kennesaw City law that if wow. you have a house within Kennesaw City limits, you have to own a gun. 
which means that probably different than almost any other district, even in red states. Voters in this district are concerned with vote, uh, or I'm sorry, with gun re uh, regulations and restrictions. And I want to show them that all I want to see is an effective criminal background check and an effective mental health check. I don't care anything else past that. I'm not, I'm not the person, I'm, I side with Bernie Sanders on this issue. If you want to have a gun and you are a responsible law-abiding citizen, go out and buy yourself a gun. I don't want any sort of restrictions. I just want on the front end of all purchases, so closing the gun show loophole, internet sales, all purchases need to go through that background check, both criminal and mental, to make sure that the person buying the gun is fit to own it. But then that's it. That's all I support. And that I think that stance in a district that is concerned primarily with gun rights is friendly enough. And then we follow that up with the rest of our stances that is very common sense and would help voters in the district. And we think that it's a perfect storm of, Yes, I have a D next to my name, but I can support this Democrat because his policies would help me and my family and my kids, and I don't lose my civil liberties that are important to me. Okay, so then, so then you you have what some people would argue. I don't I don't argue this, but you're going to get this argument from some Democrats on the left uh, that you are you compromise on guns, um, even though I agree, I pretty much agree with where you stand on guns, um, but. You're going to get that. So let's let's just kind of go down the line, right? Because there are going to be other questions asked of you when you knock on those doors. Uh, where do you stand on um, life and choice? That will be a problem because I'm not going to compromise my values to win a vote. So my stance on this issue, and I and this is how I would present it to a voter, is I believe in the right to bodily autonomy. Of let's say I am 80 years old and I'm, I'm in my deathbed and someone approaches me and says, we need your heart to save this war veteran who saved an orphanage and he needs your heart or else he's going to die. Mm -hmm. No one can force me to give that man my heart. No one can take it from me. Even mm -hmm. after I die, they still can't harvest it until, unless I sign a consent form saying that you can do that. And right. so my stance on abortion is the woman has to give the consent of her body to save the fetus's life. So my line as a man who will never be pregnant so I'm not a very good authority on this subject matter, but as a man who will never be pregnant, my stance is until the fetus is viable without the woman's body, the woman has to provide that consent. And the government cannot force the woman to provide that consent, just like they can't provide anyone else that same – they can't force them to provide that same consent. We should afford women the same rights that we afford dying males and corpses. Or else what can we call ourselves if not regressive and overbearing and controlling? And discriminatory against women. Mm, okay. All right. Let's do. Let me do a something. Um, so we're having a little uh, delay on our video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, eject. Um, or actually, I'm going to ask the Progressive Army if you guys can step out of the room. Let's see if that's going to help us out. Uh, I'm going to keep Justin in the room and see if we can get that um, get that fixed for everyone. And across uh, on YouTube, let me know if if you guys, if anyone else is experiencing that. That problem, we want to make sure that the video is coming through nice and strong for everyone. Um, Justin, I like what you're saying. I, I like what you're saying, it, and you you make a lot of sense in terms of um, in terms of the consent. They can't force us to do other things with our body, but you know, and then so likewise, we shouldn't be forcing women to do. I, I agree with that. You're going to get a lot of support from progressives on that, but in your district, you're going to get a lot of kickback on that. And so, what do you say to someone in your district? Because if people are going to support you, if people are going to spend money on trying to get you elected in this district, it has to be feasible. So, what do you say to a pro life person, a Christian evangelical in Marietta, Georgia? who is staunchly pro-life and they and you come around and tell them, I want your vote as a progressive. What do you tell that person with regard to life? What do you tell them with regard to gay marriage? What do you tell them in regard to all the things that they are just going to be a non-starter? With the keeping that subject on the pro-life debate is I technically I don't disagree with them that the life is starting whenever the fetus is conceived, barring any sort of um, miscarriages or anything like that. Theoretically, that fetus will become a baby whenever it goes to full term. My issue is, is even if the life starts at conception, just I don't agree with that per se, but let's I don't disagree on a fundamental basis with them on that. If we say that life begins at conception, OK, fine, but we still don't force non women to give consent for their bodies to save other lives. So well, I, I get that. And I don't, mean, I don't mean to cut you off, but I just, you know, because if you go if you go down that line with the person, you know, they might start 
tuning out? What's your sound bite? What is your what's your 140 characters to tell a pro-life person that you're the right person to vote for them? The Republican Party wants small government. They want government out of your lives. We should do the same thing for women. We should allow women to have the same bodily autonomy that we give every other citizen in this country. Okay. Male, female, no matter what. We just we want the Republicans want big government in their lives whenever a woman gets pregnant. And that's a hypocrisy to me. So Okay. Okay. Good. 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 I mean, I, I like that. That's a start. So I, I would just say, because um, I, I like what you're trying to do. Um, it's particularly in that district. I, what I hate more than anything else are districts that people don't have any competition in and where the party just lays down their arms and say, we're not even going to try. So I, I want you to win and, and you're going to have to have those 140 character long sentences. So what do you say? What's your 140 character uh, rebuttal to someone who's anti-gay marriage or anti-marriage equality? How do you approach that? What do you, what do you say to them? If you don't want a gay marriage, don't get one. If you <laughs> don't support gay marriage, you are not forced to partake in them. You don't have to get gay married. You can heterosexual marry. So what we're just saying is the government has no business telling people how to live their lives, which they agree with me on every other issue, except for these two issues. Just get the government out of people's lives. Let them get married. And if you don't, if you don't partake in gay marriage, don't have one. Okay. I agree with you. I think that's a, a, a decent place to start. Um, OK, let's move on to, uh, on to the next thing. Well, actually, honestly, that's going to be the number one and, and number two um, problems that you run into as you go door to door to door. And, and I like your answers to those. And so let me let's go to a little bit uh, more detail about your particular race. Do you have any support from the local and the state party? We have gotten the endorsement. That's why we were able to make it to the ballot on the Democratic Party. We have the endorsement from the county and the Georgia Democrat associations. We've been de uh, ta in talks with the Georgia House Caucus, which is the elected body of Democrats in the House of Representatives for their support and endorsement. We're working with them to be speaking to the uh, Cobb County Association of Educators mm -hmm. for their endorsement. We're talking to the North Georgia Labor Union about working with them and having their endorsement. We're just trying, we just started the campaign three weeks ago and we've already hit a point to where we have large democratic organizations behind the progressive message. We have private organizations like the teachers and the labor unions saying, we want to support a progressive candidate in a red district. So we've only been in this for three weeks. We just declared to our official candidacy. And we already have two of the biggest endorsements our campaign needs, teachers and workers. And with those two endorsements, I think our campaign becomes much more appealing to a moderate voter. And I just to take it back to Yes, my two stances on abortion and gay rights will present problems to hardcore conservatives in my district. Mm -hmm. but we looked at the voter demographics for our district, and we have a larger population of what we would call moderate or swing voters than a surrounding districts. Even in Democratic districts, there's a larger portion of those moderate and swing voters. And mm -hmm. so we're probably not going to be able to convince a hardcore Christian conservative that believes in uh, or life at conception and no gay marriage ever to vote for me. It just probably cannot happen. Okay. Have identified that if we hit those moderate swing voters and show them that our campaign is accessible to them, and then we also have teachers working with us and supporting us, and the working people of Georgia behind our campaign and supporting us, and the Democratic organization at large supporting us, it shows that progress can be real in a district where progress has not tried to come in decades. And so mm -hmm. we're running a new type of campaign, and we want to show those swing voters that they should come support us instead of the status quo conservatives. OK, uh, I have a question from our chat room. Um, one of our, our uh, members of the chat wants to know, what is your position on the ban on undocumented students at public Georgia universities? If you whenever you enroll those students, if they fill out the paperwork and they meet your paperwork requirements, they are going to school. Now, in Georgia, we don't have a lot of public financing of colleges. We have federal student loans and things like that. So if they want to take out a student loan and go to the college, that's one thing, it, but a federal document, undocumented worker accessing like hope scholarships and things like that, there have been policies put in place now in Georgia where they really have no access to those uh, benefits. And so as even as a progressive, I do believe that if you want to partake in something like the hope scholarship grants, which is our biggest source of public funding for schools or uh, federal Pell grants, if you want to take access or take advantage of those, you should be a citizen and paying taxes. I, that's how I, or I, how I justify myself and my wife going to college using those Pell and Hope grants is I paid my taxes. I will continue to be uh, paying my taxes. And so 
that's how I fund myself being able to go to, or how I and my fellow constituents fund myself going to that school. So I do support undocumented workers not being able to access that. And in Georgia, we do have those regulations on the books already. Okay. Um, we'll leave that for the audience to dissect and see where they stand on that. Um, let's see. We're going to start the debate shortly. I want to ask you a few more questions and then we'll go. Actually, I think I have time for one more question. Okay. On your local level, and this is actually too big of a question to do in two minutes, but I'm sure as hell going to try. On your local level, um, I didn't see anything on your uh, site about Black Lives Matter. Um, and I know you mentioned that you're having a meeting with Kennesaw State University and some students there, particularly Black Lives Matter. But tell me, what can you do on the local level um, on, with regard to criminal justice reform and with regard to other issues in the African-American community, um, economic issues, just a whole broad range? What do you see on your radar that could address issues that are pertinent to the Black Lives Matter movement? And we have, I hate to do this to you, but you got 60 seconds. All right. We're, we have a meeting scheduled next week with a representative for the Cobb County Police, which is the county that this district lies in. And what I'm going to present to that uh, official and that representative that's a friend of mine is to show I want to increase pay for police. But that increase, in, because the police do a hard job, but part of that increase is, by, is also to increase training. And so you have community sensitivity training. You have how to handle a um, hostile situation training. And then you also uh, put in a third party review board, a sort of organization to where whenever there's a, a police officer involved shooting, instead of there an internal review process or internal affairs investigation, which people on the outside look at and say, no, I don't believe that that's corrupt. We have a third party review board come in and not only does that help the constituents where they can truly believe those findings, but it also helps the police in that their constituencies actually trust the findings of those reports. And finally, while not a problem in my exact district, police forces must look like the communities that they serve. And so a part of increasing the pay for police officers that do their job well is allowing HR departments of those police forces to go in their local communities and recruit from there instead of bringing police officers from outside of the district that can commute and take lower wages. So I think all of those will help increase public trust, make sure that the police interact with their communities responsibly and allow police officers to do their job effectively, but also sensitive to their communities that they serve. All right, Justin, Justin Holsenbach, listen, I, in that little 20 minutes, I think we had a really great conversation. The number one thing I picked up from you, Justin, is that you know your issues, you have a game plan, and you're ready to execute that game plan. So really quickly, before we start this debate coverage, tell everyone how they can get to your site and how they can support you. We have a website. It is Justin, my first name, J-U-S-T-I-N, the number four GA.com. On there, it has a biography, more about me as a candidate, where I stand on our major campaign platform issues, and our social media links. If you can go on there, if you can donate, great. But even more than that, signing up to volunteer if you're local for our district or you're local in the Atlanta area, or signing up for our newsletter to just stay informed, but most importantly, just sharing our website and our social media links. And if any person that's viewing this program wants me to clarify my position on something or get more in-depth explanation of something I said or an issue that we didn't address, there's a contact form on our website that goes directly to my personal email. And I respond to those emails within hours. And I have, right now I have five email threads going of people that wanna discuss in-depth issues with me. And so just justin4ga.com and share those links for us and get involved. We need people to reach out to us, discuss with us what they want to see before they show their support. And that's important. If you support our campaign, I want you to believe in bringing progress to our district. Our campaign slogan is progress, not politics. And I truly believe in that. Progress, not politics. Justin Wholesome back. Um, you're going to hang out with us a little while for the debate? Sure will. That's awesome. So, okay, um, the Progressive Army, I'm sorry I had to put you out, but I had some.